Hi guys, welcome back to the D2 Talks. My name is Fabio Palvelli and I'm your host for today. This week on the channel, I have the pleasure to have Philip Horton of Mr. P. Mr. P is one of the biggest names in the field of architectural visualization out there in Australia and I was really looking forward to have these guys on the show. Like this video if you find it interesting, please share it with your friends and family and your colleagues and share it, share it, share it, because this really helps growing our channel. And of course, hit the subscribe button if this is your first time here. Guys, enjoy this beautiful talk. Mr. P. Is it is it is it weird for me to call you Mr. P? I mean, that's that's what the P stands for, right? Yeah, well, P, yeah, it is. It's Mr. P. It's, I think I was in Bali, and I was trying to think of a brand, and I used to be called uh, PH UK Design because I was always from UK. Philip Horton's my first name, but that, that spells fuck design. But then uh, one of my clients was like, you've got to stop being called fuck design. You've got to get serious. So then I just shortened it to Mr. P. I think I was in Bali and they were like, Mr. Philip, Mr. Philip. So I was like, let's keep it simple. Mr. P, everything in Australia is abbreviated like, and shortened. So I was like, Mr. P, it's easy. Phil, let me ask you, how did your Australian adventure start? Because you're from the UK. But then you moved to yeah. Australia and you opened this office, which ended up being very successful. Would you mind reconstructing a little bit the the history of Did Mr. P? Yeah, I'll try and keep it pretty short. I basically met a girl in Berlin in a nightclub because back then I wanted to be a professional DJ. I didn't really think about a 3D career like full time. But I was a 3D artist um, for six, seven years. I met the girl. She was Australian. She moved to Manchester. And then she was like, it's raining all the bloody time here. Get me home. Uh, if you want to be with me, you move back with me. And I, I never even thought about getting a holiday to Melbourne. I rocked up here and it was raining because I came in August. And I was like, it's basically the same as Manchester. Um, the, we the, the weather here is terrible um, most of the time. And then uh, I was in a bit of a di dilemma. I thought I was going to be a professional DJ. Didn't quite make it. Moved here. Didn't know anyone connection-wise. So I luckily brought my laptop with me and I just started, I got my portfolio together, sent it out and the architects just started picking it up and saying, because I was lucky who I'd worked with in the UK, I'd worked with some big agencies and um, yeah, I, I just started getting work and I offered a few jobs and I decided that I could probably go on my own. I took the gamble to just go on my own. And back then, I suppose freelancing is pretty cool that you can work for six, seven months, go traveling for three months. So I did that for a few years. And then I fight, then clients get angry and they're like, <laughs> where are you for like, th where, where are you for like between June and August? And I'm like, around like Burning Man and whatever. So they, uh, they basically pinned me down and said, you need to get stuff. And that's why I, I suddenly started growing probably five years ago, six years ago. And yeah, we've slowly grown from one to about 14, 15 now. Feel free not to answer this question, but are you still yeah. with the same girl? Yeah, I am. yeah, 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 we're married. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true, yeah, we've got a little daughter, one, so yeah, we, yeah, it was, it was a good decision to make. And, and, and actually, I'll probably mention it a few times, a lot of things in life, I believe in fate, I believe in luck. I think 95% luck, 4% hard work, and 1% talent, and... Uh, the 95% luck is I moved to Melbourne just as there's a lot of Chinese investment. The planning minister was a bit dodgy and would let 90-story towers go up anywhere. So there was just an abundance of work. It was like it was like the gold rush again, and it was just constant development after development. So we, I landed in a city that was just built for ArcViz. It was crazy. I think it went from four studios to like 14 or 15 within a year when I first started. And now there's probably 25 in Melbourne. It's it's mental. Um, um, as you're speaking, I'm showing some of your work, and we're going to. I think it's, a good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we're, it's just your website. We're going to talk a little bit about your work because it's, uh, you know, I've seen your presentation in uh, in Australia a year ago yeah. now. Was it a year ago? Uh, yeah, it's year February. Yeah. Oh my uh, God, time February. passes fast. Huh? I know. Imagine that. Feels like yesterday that I was down under. <laughs> Yeah, man, what a beautiful country! I think that Sydney was really the most beautiful city I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, it's clean. It's yeah, it's eye candy, isn't it? It's it's good wherever you look. Yeah, it's a beautiful city. It's amazing. I do like it. But anyway, let me prefer go... Melbourne. But... <laughs> 
let me let me go back a little bit to what you were saying about you know believing in fate and luck i think that it's also like i think that the the your decision of like following the person that you loved was also a smart one and i think that nowadays a lot of people they don't consider the importance of like being in a good relationship and giving the right amount of energy and care to the people that are actually supporting us. Yeah. And I don't know, I do you in retrospective, do you think that if this situation you meeting who then became your wife didn't happen, that you would be in the same exact situation as you are today, like having your 3D company and be so, so successful? Not a chance. I would still be trying to be a DJ, probably. And, and, how, and how lucky would that be? Because in the current climate, the hospitality, nightlife trade has been hammered. Um, I think the property industry, well, uh, us, we were still really busy. So uh, it's fate. I'm lucky that I'm in an industry. And it's always, it's always the grass is always green. I've always thought, I wish I, was still a pro, I wish I could have been a big pro DJ. But now I would have been sat in a bedroom locked away, I don't know, in New York hating life, not being able to work, probably stressing to pay my bills. And I'm fortunate that we can actually, in what we do, we can work from anywhere in the world on computers and still service our clients. And there's still enough work on at the moment, touch yeah. wood. Um, so, yeah, no, I don't think I would be in the situation I was. Plus, that girl was very lucky and trusted me when I first got here that she didn't charge me rent in her apartment. So I live for free. And I think that's... You need, you need luck like that because there's no way you can start a business if you know if you, have, if you had rent to pay you'd have to go and get a job and being able to uh, devote the first six to twelve months rent free was a massive break for me I was very lucky she believed in me I trusted her she trusted me she's also now a director as well um, so yeah it we were we we're very lucky well I was very lucky that she trusted me her parents I, didn't but yeah they did. I, I like that I like that because you know like it feels like the society that we live in, they people don't really see relationships as a good thing for their own growth and personal development. Whilst I think that the fact that you are accountable when you are in a relationship with a person and that you, you have to care about the other yeah. person, it also pushes you to mature and to be more responsible in a way which I think that it's sometimes something that it's missing, especially f uh, in the uh, younger designers. And, you know, hopefully we can touch up a little bit on this as well uh, later. Um, you know, what could you recommend young designers to do when trying to build their own companies? But first, let me ask you, was there something that inspired you throughout the beginning of your career to push yourself to, um, you know, open this company? Or was it only because your clients told you to <laughs> sit the fuck down <laughs> and open a company? <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of pretty much that. I'm, no, I, Yeah, it, it's a really hard decision, actually, to start a company because you do lose a lot of freedom. And you're not only accountable for yourself, you're accountable for the people you employ. You want to have you know they're entrusting you not only for education and a good experience and a good kind of place to work but also so they can pay their bills they want to rely on their boss not to take the piss i think and there's a lot of responsibility and uh it's not and at that time i didn't know how much work it actually was going to be so it was a big decision for both of us i mean we, i have a business coach as well i have a few different mind coaches and stuff to try and get my mind in the right headspace but um yeah, it's a lot of work between me and my wife saying, oh, is this what we really want? Because as a freelancer, as most freelancers know, you can earn a lot of good money, as much as what you can in a business. It takes so long to set systems, procedures up, uh, get the business working. You don't see any sort of profit of an artist for at least 8 to 12 months plus, probably, after you sat them down. So it's, it's a big investment. Then the artist can turn around and go, I've learned all I need to learn. I'm going to start my own company. So, which is fine, it's totally fine, but that's the risk you take as an employer. Um, I've lost my train of thought a little bit, but yeah, I, I basically, no, I didn't have any kind of thought of 
I, I need to build a, a company of 15, 20, 30 people. It's just grown very slowly, organically. Uh, I know everyone says that word organically, but uh, it has really been that process. Uh, all I ever wanted to do, my goal was to, to be the best I can be, and hopefully that is the best in the world. I've, I've changed my way of thinking now. I, I used to be driven by my ego. I used to be, I need to be the best in the world because commercial work because we're not doing work like beautiful competition images we're doing marketing images that sell off the plan it's a total different language to the stuff that me do you know it's they're, they're like the usain bolts the sprinters we're like the marathon runners N not as pretty but it's kind of the, the, the gears the grinding of trying to shift property um you just got a bit of romance in it i'm not playing it down but it's a different language kind of it's the same sport different language but uh uh, I forgot where I was going, but yeah. Uh, long story short, I haven't actually thought of I need a business. No, until the client said you need to provide a service. So let be me, reliable. I suppose. So let me ask you this instead. In retrospective, now looking back, you know, in the very beginning, you were moved by the fact that you said I can work three months and then I can take three months off. You know, that's a good mentality for somebody that is trying to you know find a gig with which then they can go out and do whatever they want but in retrospective looking back would you think that this is not the right attitude in order to build a successful business or do you think that people can still actually uh, juggle between you know being free and being part-time artists that's a great question. Um, I think, yeah, because like I said, if you're setting out to build a business, you would 100% not do it the way I did it. Uh, and I did that over two to three years. It wasn't like uh, three months and three months off of what we're doing. It was like three years, and then I was like, you, you kind of get forced with the tax system as well. Now you're not a sole trader. Now you're a PTY, you know, a limited company because of what you're earning, whatever. So you kind of get forced down routes, and you're like, oh, maybe it's worth actually employing people now. Um, I, I, I guess you, to answer this question straight up, no, this is not the way you should go about setting up a business. <laughs> uh, not at all. But you've got to be comfortable in what you're doing, and, and there's a lot of risks involved. You know, the first time I took a, like, I remember when my friend who, when I was a, a fellow freelancer, was like, "Get out!" I was in my underpants, 24/7, <laughs> and, and, and he was like, "Get out of your house and come to a, a, a shared office and like rent a desk." I used to rent a desk and never even go in because I'd just be constantly working, and I'll have like ellen degeneres on in the background and clients would ring and they'd be like can you turn the tv down please and i'd be like oh shit it would be like <laughs> really unprofessional and i didn't sometimes my wife would come home and be like you've not even left the house in two days go and have a shower because i'd be like really it's trying to get this render better uh this dressing i was working on two laptops and even buy a render farm it's like a laptop laptop this yeah, using re rebus to render stuff and then yeah you, you get to a point where like, i need to become professional uh, it is time to maybe step out into the real world and sit down and have a normal life and get balance in your life because, yeah. You know, the reason why I ask you this, it's because there is essentially uh, a big issue in today's freelance um, gig world, so to say, which is a lot of people get into the business with the sole scope of being financially independent enough so that they can go and live their life without having to work too much. And so, you know, I get this from the emails that I get from especially the younger people. They tell me, listen, the reason why I want to do this is because I want to travel the world and I want to do this and I want to do that. And then at the bottom of their pyramids of whys, is, and then, of course, you know, because I want to help my clients. And I'm like, take that, yeah. <laughs> reverse it. And it's like at the base, there yeah. should be like the priorities of your clients. And I see a lot of people, because they try to live their life like this, they are in a position where their relationship with their clients is very thin. They are seen as replaceable people that can work on a project. And so very often this push them to charge very little money because they don't take the business serious. And so what I'm trying to get to is 
if we wanted to help people understanding how to do this job, what is the message that we should share with the younger generations? Is it possible to do this job and so to say, live your dream life? Or is this a job that doesn't allow you to do that kind of stuff? Because in my experience, and I've been doing this for about 11 years now, I don't know anybody who is, you know, free to do what they want. I only know people that work and keep working because they need to keep up with all the technology, with all the software and the time that they have available. These guys, they go to conferences, they go to meetups, they go to workshops because they take their job serious. And of course, they're very successful from a financial point of view. But I know that these guys are working 24-7. Can you say otherwise yourself? Uh, no, you can't. Like, you got to live and breathe it, especially in this... Like I said, I was in my underpants 24-7. So, yeah, even when I worked at the neighbourhood in the UK, I, I was doing all-nighters. I was doing... Sometimes, I remember 36-hour shifts that it went straight through, and I, I felt guilty asking to leave because I was waiting for comments to come back, and then they called me back at, like, 5 p.m. It, like, like, I had, like, four hours sleep. Um, I just, I'm not saying that's a good thing to do. 100% would never want my staff to do that. But I'm saying, you know, you have to put the work in. And there's not a minute I don't think about the business. Well, hopefully there is some time. But like, I'm constantly thinking, whether it's in the shower, the toilet, walk to work, this, this. You, you, it's, you don't stop. You don't turn off. Even on the holidays, I'm always thinking, working, oh, that could work better. Oh, look, I'm in, in the hotel. Oh, how's that service? That's really good. That could work for us. And, uh, look at that material. Oh, look how it's working, that material. On. It, it's just constant. And I think that's the difference. If people think they can just check in and check out in anything in life, they do. They're, they're living in the dream world, and that's you're just doing a half-hearted job, I think. You've got to be passionate about what you do, and you've got to put the energy and time in. Actually, what you just said, I think it's gold. It's in everything in life. I I don't know what sold us as a society on this idea that as of now you can, you know, like, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that people should work 24-7, but if you're working on something and if you're doing it as a job professional, um, I don't think that we could... I don't think there is a way to say, you know, you can do it and have fun and, and, and be free at the same time. I don't know. I think that, you know, uh, myself, when I had the period in my life where I said I want to be free and I want to travel the world, I took very low responsibility jobs. You know, I was a waiter. I worked as a dishwasher. And for a period of a couple of years, I said, screw it. You know, I'm going around the, the, the planet yeah. and I see what I do. The moment that I started to get focused on architecture, that became my new reality. And actually, that's a question that I wanted to ask you. You said you talk, you think about your business 24-7. How does your wife handle you when, you know, you're thinking and maybe you're spacing out on a... Yeah, she knows, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she always picks up on it. And even, like, lighting, I'm constantly looking at lighting conditions. Oh, look at that, look at this. And that's what she likes. That's why she fell in love with me, how I will find new nuances and moments in life when we're walking down the road. And like, well, look at that, and I'll stop and take it in, take a photo of a random texture, just the movement of clouds, anything. That it, I think that's, you've got to click, and, yeah, that's how we met and what we'd like. Um Sorry, I forgot what I was about to say. What was the question again? <laughs> that, it's all right. It's all right. There was no question. Actually, you know, I should yeah. do a better job of shutting the hell up and let you do the talking. But anyway. Yeah, yeah, right. no, 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 that's cool. No, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> but anyway, uh, listen, dude, you know, like the reason why I wanted to have this conversation with you, it's really that night that we went out in Sydney after the conference, we sat... Yeah. Uh, me, you, and uh, what's your business partner that was there, the uh, business associate, uh, what oh, was his name? Yeah, oh, the creative director, Mark. Mark, 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 exactly, yes. Yeah. And, like, I've had such a, a fun, interesting conversation. I don't know if you remember it. I mean, you know, we had a few yeah, beers. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, like... Um, the way you guys approach your work to me it's very very interesting and you know i wish that a lot more people would take 
the process of like consulting their clients on um, what needs to be done. And I, I'm trying to ask you the question without laughing because I remember what you said at the <laughs> at the at the conference in Sydney <laughs> that there are no trees so up high on <laughs> building. Oh yeah. <laughs> I know, yeah, and the bloody penthouse, they want dappled light, it's like they've got trees on the moon, yeah, I know, it's fucking ridiculous, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, can you break down a little bit the way you guys work with your clients and how you try to steer them in the right direction uh, throughout a, uh, a project? Yeah, cool. I, I think the most important thing uh, in anything is, is the kickoff meeting. You need to get all the key stakeholders involved. You need to get the real estate guys because they always have a strong personality, the, the actual development team, the architects and the interior designers, stylists. You need to bring, oh, and then obviously the marketing agency who are doing the branding. You need to get them all together and you need to, before you even get them together, ask many questions. And it's that kickoff meeting that you can really kind of decide the direction for the project. Uh, and you, and we put a lot of energy in that in the beginning of every project. Like, what's unique about this building? How can we sell it? You know, is what, what, what's the palette doing? You know, what type of photography would you recommend? So we'll go and search all over online from Serial Magazine to Yellow Trace, all different blogs of a Pumo, whatever it's called, Wallpaper, and really find unique photographers like Rory Gardner, Tom Blackford, depending on the project, and build a, a catalog for their project to how we think their brand for the visual language for the images we're creating is, should look uh, and it's, it could be anything it could be like if the building's metallic you know, like we think this type of photography this time of day I think it, it's that foundation at the beginning and getting everyone on board I think it's the key thing and it, as soon as you get everyone on board then they will follow your lead a lot stronger rather than you just plonking a dust shot on their lap and saying this is what you should do there needs to be a bit of thought behind it and then they have confidence in you um so, Phil, let I me think. ask you another question. Um, how do you go from that stage where you receive an email from an architect that says, we need four images, give us your best price, to the position of saying, no, 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 no. We get all the people together. We do a survey of what the project uh, is. We need to get to the bottom of what it needs to be done. How do you get from the bottom of the food chain all the way up where you have the chance and the authority to bring all the people together and consult them all together so that you are, a, um, so to say, in a position of calling the shots in the process? Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, sorry, I should explain that we would already have won the job. <laughs> but when we only do kickoff meetings for, it's for every job. That's, like, that's our first stage. We have like a production workflow document that stipulates the four stages of our workflow and um, that's the first stage. But it's only for jobs that we've won. So if an architect came to us four images to give us your best price, we'll be <laughs> that's quite funny. But yeah, <laughs> we're like, well, what? we need to look at the documentation first. We have no fixed fees. The problem I find in Australia when I got here, I'd never heard of it before. It was every, well, it's price per render. Like, how can you price per render? We, we, we've, we've not priced per render since, well, in six years, I don't think. We've been priced on how long it takes, how many artists you need, what are the level of the artists you need. You might need a, model, a modeler, a se two senior artists, a creative lead, and me or Mark as creative directors. To, and we work out how much my time, Mark's time, the actual artist's time you need, and then we'll give you a price. Um, we can give you a ballpark, but it doesn't mean anything. If you've got a five tower master plan compared to a bathroom it's a different price so yeah when architects do ask that they are how much you per render we want four renders we just say we we quote per project basically um but yeah I, I, a lot of people want it per render because what clients are worried about is if they want to add two or three more renders on they need to know their budgets and how, if they can afford to do that so i appreciate what they're trying to do but we always just say no and if people are starting to ask about money early conversations they're generally people we try and avoid working with we're just like no nah. I, 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 people have to be right to ask you don't go into a restaurant order a steak and then expect it to be ten dollars and then it's 150 but it, yeah it, I, I, if, they, if they start fighting on price loads we're just like they're not right for us 
And I think that's one of the main things I've learned in business is don't be afraid to say no. <laughs> Always say, we've turned down, I think, more work than we've actually said yes to in the last 18 months. Just purely just fit. You need to get the right fit. Like I said, you need to onboard the right people, get the right agency involved, the right architects and shared visions uh, much better collaboratively. You know, everyone's trying to work together. So when we do present, and it's quite daunting presenting a concept to people that have been work in our kickoff meeting that have been working on the project sometimes two or three years. This at the end, this is their baby they've been working on, and all they've known as is their project is best in this light and from this angle. And then I come in and say, "No, nah, that needs to be shot on a 50 mil from here, and it needs to be a totally different lighting backlit." And they're just like, "What? Who the fuck's this dude?" Uh, <laughs> but it, but it. it there's a thought into it and it is a conversation i'm not saying this is what we do and it's tough luck we'll do one it's a conversation but um it's about respecting each other and we're not always right I, i'm I, i'm gladly put my hands up many times saying shit we've got this wrong it's not working so sorry we'll change direction and then we wear those costs I, i'm there till x o'clock at night trying to fix it because my initial vision that i saw in the shower and then google quickly on sunday morning is not going to work for your building uh, yeah sorry i probably ranted a bit there <laughs> how how long it, uh, did it take you to go from you know um, i'm getting jobs and i have to do everything that i can to uh, bring money to the company to be in the position of saying no this doesn't work for us we have to say no to this project and the reason why we can say no it's because we don't need the money um, but we want to be the ones that call the shots, and so we want to be involved under our conditions. How long did it take you? Uh, it, it, that's a good question. It's not really about how long it takes. It's, it's how many times I make the mistake of saying yes to the wrong project. I reckon, it, and working with the wrong client, probably three or four years, probably longer, five years, I'd say. I, I did it a long time. I say, I say in the last four I said 18 months, two years, where we really have to said no. I'd, I'd rather not pay myself, and I'm being serious. It's not worth the pain. And the, the annoying thing is, when you say yes to projects that you know you shouldn't be doing, your gut saying don't do this. It's gonna. Be. When you say no to a project, it actually opens up other doors because we've said yes to bad projects before that have killed us. And we knew we shouldn't have took it. My, my gut said, do not take this project. And then literally a week later, we've had to turn down an amazing opportunity because we're too busy. And that happened so many times over the last seven, eight years. I couldn't even count how many times it happened. That another studio has got a better project that originally approached us to do. And we're stuck chipping away at some absolute terrible project with, yeah, with a project team who don't want even... They, they say they like your work but I don't think they're actually even looked at your work. It feels like sometimes you produce what you think should be done and then they just disregard that. I mean, in our images, there's not many blue skies. We purposely don't put blue skies. In Australia, it is very blue. It is saturated. The Chinese market here, or the, not the Chinese, the Asian market, likes to know that Australia has clean skies. That's why the marketing teams like big blue skies. We always fight against that and say we don't do it. And then we'll get random clients saying, you need to make the sky blue. We're like, well, we're never exposing to the interior, not the exterior. So it will blow out and there's a lot of fighting. And I think I, I brushed up on that on, on the talk in Sydney. How you, we need more of us to fight that fight. But a lot of people back down. And unfortunately, yeah, it's a hard fight on your own. Talking about fighting fights. Um, lately, there was a post from a friend of mine, Jeff Mottle complaining about some of the companies sending out, visualization companies sending out emails saying um, that they're offering now very big discounts on images because of this coronavirus. I think yeah. this is a desperate gesture and it's a very dangerous one for people to do. Would you agree with that statement? Oh. One million. I think any time you should not be doing that ever, ever, ever. You should never. You're showing your hands. Why would you ever do that? I've no idea. Even coronavirus, no coronavirus, it's ridiculous. I'm, everyone should be putting their prices up every year, not reducing. And, uh, yeah, I agree. I'm a big believer. It's it's a crazy thing that the markets worldwide they have been going up of about 
30% on average worldwide. In Australia, it's 35% since the 2000 crash. The price of the built market went up 35%. Yet, yeah. the price of images got halved. And so people are offering like less than half the price that they used to offer 20 years ago, which to me, it's crazy because often you hear the argument, yeah, technology makes things cheaper, makes things faster. But the reality is that the people that are involved in the process, those, they still need to get paid. Yeah. And as far as I'm concerned, this is r really the situation in which we're in. It's all man made simply because people don't know what the hell they're doing. And, you know, in running their companies, very often there isn't a purpose other than to say, we have a company and we have business and we're great. And look at us, how beautiful our images are. You know, I get criticized very often because of these sentiments, because people say we're free to do whatever we want. And I'm, you know, I'm not here to debate that. The only thing is that it is crazy to me to think that 20 years ago, a rendering will cost 10,000 uh, euros, a good one. And now people are selling images, very good images for 500, 600 bucks, you know, and they're killing themselves yeah. in the process. And that's another thing, you know, like these guys, one or two years down the road, they disappear. Yeah. Because they simply uh, cannot, cannot go f uh, forward with this. And so, you know, um, I was looking at the um, Australian market and it seems like the Australian market is still holding up to this, right? People still... Yeah, it's pretty strong. Yeah, yeah, it's still strong. It's actually had a bit of a resurgence. Like, it dipped last year up until about October. And then from October onwards, it's kicked on and nearly back to 2017 like uh, prices uh, a lot, lot of some areas held as well so yeah it's it's booming again it was booming again until a recent couple of weeks but the house next door to me sold for more than it's like last weekend sold for it more than what it sold two years ago so it, it's it, it's still there's a lot of confidence here i think in the market unfortunately now it's gonna be a bit tougher um we're not having open for inspections it's gonna be tricky selling real estate but I think it will come good. A lot of people I've been speaking to, clients who are pretty well clued up, are saying they reckon September, October, we sh they're all predicting that. And, and that's what I mean. All that we're still are not for be annoying to people, but we're really busy. Uh, our pipeline's strong till gone June. We're already quoting on jobs for June onwards. Confirmed a couple, um, and I think a lot of our clients saying we don't care. We just want to be ready. For September, I know it's easy to say that now. In two weeks' time, the whole thing could change. You yeah. know, and I'm not being naive because I, I, I was working in 2008 when it crashed. But it, it, at the moment, people are still saying we're we're, we're going to we're going to be ready for September. We want to be ready to launch, and that's that's a big t market in Melbourne uh, or Australia that spring launch. Let um, me let me ask you: What do you think? Like, if you were to think of one component that has allowed you for you and your team to be still on business right now, what would that be? Is it the relationship that you have with your clients? Is it the quality of your images? W what is it? Like only one thing, if you were to think of the minimum denominator. That's a great question. I was going to say brand and word of mouth, if I can say that. I, 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 to be honest, we still get like in the last week, I mean, our quotes have dropped this month, I think. Last month, we had like 40, 50 quotes. This month, I reckon we're probably at around 25-ish, 30. So not loads, but there's still 25, 30 quotes. We can convert five of them. It would be good. Um, the, I would, I, I think, I don't know. I think, yeah, the quality of the images, there's something about, but I say brand. I, I, there's something about brand that people will go to. I don't know, but why do people like Prada? Well, I'm not saying we're Prada, but I'm saying why do people go to certain brands? I, I feel like there's word of mouth and it, the brand that's been built. And do you yeah. think, what is, okay, what is one of the values that you think your brand relies the most on? I'm trying to break down the way people look at your company. And I have a I have a theory, but I'm gonna keep it for myself. 
But I want to I wanna hear it from you. I want to hear what do you think it is that people see in your brand, in your company, when they say Mr. P? Well, we get told a lot is it's a consistency in the look of our work. Like, there's a lot of good studios out there, so many now, and there's literally as like freelancers popping up with their mini studios, which is great, but there's, everyone has a similar look in a, in, in, in a kind of way. Uh, and we have a, I feel like we have a slightly different look. I think everyone gets to 95%. I'm not saying we're 100%, I'm just saying in, in a look, and it's very good, it's photo rear, it's nice lighting, it's, it, yeah. but then there's something is this extra five percent that we get told that ours looks different, not better, just different, and and with the market being so saturated, especially in Australia, with like I said, we're still under supply by fifty thousand. We should be turning over more than fifty thousand new builds a year, and we're not hitting that. So there's so much work out there. You open up the local paper, there's like twenty, thirty pages of new developments, and all the developments look the same. So it's, it's that looking the same, that golden afternoon, dappled light, which I banged on about in the conference. I feel like that we try and not to do that. We try and do what everyone else is doing. We try and do the opposite. Not the opposite or just slightly different. I think that that's all I can say. It's really, it's really hard to break down. I, I honestly don't know. That's what I get told. But cause it, we, we quote against, I don't want to mention names, but there's two or three we would constantly quote against. Uh and that is all they say you're just slightly different looking and i'm sure that when they win jobs <laughs> their clients say you're just slightly different looking so maybe i don't know maybe it means nothing but yeah i think it also coming from europe coming here where everything was very saturated in in, in the tones of imagery and i was in gray manchester where everything was a, you know a bit of prep the clouds are on my head every day um it, and it's raining when i came here and i, I stripped a lot of color out of the work that really kick-started uh, Mr. P, really. We had a different look to everyone else here. They'd that, been here for 10 years, like the flood sizes, and who founded this market. Uh, and I think that's what helped. To me, th this is all very valuable information that you're sharing with me. The only thing is that I'm afraid that what people are going to get from this thing that you just said is, okay, so I need to desaturate my images. <laughs> No, no, it's definitely not that. No, and, this, and actually, that's funny because when I first came, brought over, people started mimicking the style that I did, and it's quite heavy in contrast. Uh, my older work, so you look back on in Instagram, probably two or three years, probably older, it, it, but this work that was done like seven years ago, it, 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 people started copying that, but they didn't get the levels right. People don't study photography like they think they do. They think they see a picture, but they're not actually studying the picture. They're not measuring the blacks, measuring the white points. That, yeah, it, it, I, like, I, in the conference, I talked about grading and how you have your own look. And I think that's the only thing that's going to differentiate people in this crowded market is how you grade. Photographers grade completely differently, and I think that some don't do much at all. And you can tell this is shot digitally. Uh, at the moment, I'm really interested in how people shoot on film. So I'm interested in uh, art, uh, photographers like Rory Gardner, who's shooting on really old school cameras. And he's and he, he's sent me his Photoshop files, and I've looked at them, how he's broken it down, how he's converted the negative, and his grading. And it just blows my mind that, that the intricacy and the delicate kind of grading techniques. And he's got his look. I don't know if you know Rory Gardner, but if you Google him, you'll see he has his own look and style. Um, and I think that's what people need to get. They need to get their own style, not just rely on certain render engines and plug and play textures. Um, it comes down to really composition and grade, I think. Obviously, lighting is important, but you, your grade can do a lot. Okay, now I'm going to share with you the way I see it, why people keep yeah. coming to you. I think you guys have placed yourself uniquely in the market you are a boutique to me it feels like when we talk about visualizations and i go around and i look at uh, different websites of different people to almost like if i were to compare it to a, a clothing brand you'd be sort of like off-white or uh, i don't know comme de garçon you know it's something that it's limited it's very small in quantity and even like the way your website looks it's like 
this is everything that we have. It's not like a catalog of, of images. Um, and I feel from the conversation that I've had with you that clients also perceive you this way, that they come to you because they know that when they need something important, they can rely on your ability to drive them and to guide them through a, a project. And I don't know why, but this is, you know, like the impression that I've had um, during our conversations in, you know, in Sydney. Um, and I don't know, um, I talked about it with also other designers based in Australia and they kind of told me the same thing, you know, when people really need very good work, they don't look around, they do not ask for proposals, they just go to Mr. P because they know that Mr. P will deliver the unique piece. That's it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a fair observation. And yeah, it's probably better, yeah, kind of, I trust what I was trying to maybe explain in a way, but uh, yeah. I think that I think the good point about scalability as well because it's very easy to get carried away and keep employing people because when there's so much work there is like I said when I first got here there's so much work it's a conscious decision not to grow bigger it gets to a point and we've had many teaching issues along the way when you grow from two to six to eight to twelve to fourteen whatever it, and it gets to a point where now I'm just like I physically can't grow any bigger because I, I'm still over every single image I still checkpoint at four stages on every image from the initial kickoff to the white cards in my head there is like at the moment 150 different images from 17 different projects and comments on all of them that, that, you know, that I, I, i'm working with different artists on it, it it was easier when it was about six to eight and then you get teething problems quality drops then you come back up then you get settled and i have a lot of support with the seniors and uh the creative leads but it's still at the end of the day it all falls on my head they, they they can go home it's not them worrying about will that client return again if we do a shit job well no it, you know I, they're still going to get paid I, it's me who i won't pay myself i will always pay my staff first um so yeah it's scalability i think yeah boutique people like boutique they trust because a couple of jobs we've won recently have been like who are going to be the key people on this job and they were like, and the other company it was a larger company in Australia. Said, "Oh, it'll be a team in Sydney or Brisbane." And I could say, "It will be me and four other artists X, Y, Z." And that's what they learned. That's what they went with us because I said it was me. And and, and there's not many larger studios that can say that. I don't think. Mm. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they can. I'd, I, I'd, I'd be surprised. Phil, can you believe it that we've been talking for an hour already? Oh, have we? Sorry, I did rant on a bit. No, it's all, right. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. To me, this is a sign of success. And actually, this is one of the questions that I wanted to ask you because, you know, the conversation flew very natural and I didn't have to do a lot of talking. And, you know, the reason why I often do a lot of talking, it's because I tend to rumble myself as well. And so for yeah. that, I am <laughs> thankful for you to being able to take the lead on the... <laughs> on the stuff that I was asking yeah. you. But talking about, okay, let me ask you first about purpose, you know? Do you think about the idea of purpose? You mentioned that you work with like business coaches, so I guess that they help you also trying to focus on what your purpose uh, is or should be. Do you ever think about the idea of purpose? Do you know what your purpose is? Do you feel like you know what your purpose is? And it could be personal, professional. Yeah, I mean, I had a daughter a year ago. She's one year now, which is awesome. And it changed my whole perspective. I remember other studio heads were telling me, oh, when you have a daughter, you won't be doing your 20-hour shifts or whatever. It'll change everything. I was like, whatever. But it has changed a lot. Last year, it was very difficult the first six months trying to have like no sleep, run a studio. It, it would just totally change everything. It's... Um, I had a lot of work with a counsellor just trying to when, when I was trying to work out what everything's about I questioned everything actually it, it got quite deep to a point where it got so deep I actually pulled away and thought oh well I'm not ready to dig any deeper uh, <laughs> about <laughs> I like, I, I, yeah, I'm not I opening that door 
I'm like, do I actually want to go there now? Uh, but yeah, it, 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 yeah, I, I don't know my purpose. I'm still searching for that um, to answer your question straight. But I know that a lot of my early days were driven by ego and driven by the wrong, the wrong uh, values, I suppose. Uh, it was always about the best, got to be the best. And, but I don't think I'd ever be happy with the best. I think my idea of the best is unattainable in my own head. I, I never, after I do a piece of work, I'm, I'm happy with it for a well, I'm never super happy, but I'm happy enough with it. But then after a while, I just don't like it anymore. I, I'm always picking faults in everything I do. So I, I'm trying to find out when can I be happy with myself. I need to be kinder to myself. And that's one of my main goals this year, to be kinder to myself. And, yeah, hopefully I'll work out what my purpose is. But I think just being a good person is is a good start and being good to people. And I believe in karma. And, yeah, I, I think what goes around comes around. And if you're good to people, that they do good things to you. And, yeah, Sometimes, spread the you know, love. Aiming at being a decent person, it's all that it takes. Yeah. <laughs> What does success look like to you? Um, that, that's changed a lot as well. Success used to be me in a little beach shack on a couple of decks uh, in the Bahamas or somewhere <laughs> nice. <laughs> Just having easy, cracking a few Coronas and then, uh, yeah, having a paddle in the sea and then getting back on the decks. But... Um, The, yeah, success now is, I suppose, a, a work-life balance. Still producing great work, having a great team around me, uh, everyone working to the same goals, happiness, and spending time with my family. I think that's success. I don't even see money anymore. And as like, I used to be a driver. Like, can you keep when, when you need uh, money, you keep buying things. Like, I'll buy that chair. I'll buy that bit of clothing. You can never quench your thirst for more mm. i feel like uh, maybe some people can but i'm trying to work around now like that i don't need any of this um that's what yeah it's, it's, that's a good question but yeah i'm trying to just get back to basics really and i think this is this is quite an it, the one positive of this coronavirus thing is it is going to reset a lot of things and i think it's that's one thing that you can actually i've been speaking to my friends back home because i was from the uk way more I, i just kind of when i get into work mode i just forget about everyone in europe even my mum and dad i've been speaking to them two three times four times a week compared to like once every two weeks so it, it, i'm getting to reconnect again i think i feel good that i, I that life's about love care and friendships it's not just about hammering away in a computer screen um like i said i'm still digging now <laughs> i totally agree with you and i think that you know even though it has brought disruption and destruction also in certain countries look at what happened in italy i think in a way you know i don't want to sound like a a stoner but i think that um <laughs> This is, bringing, this is bringing us back with our feet to the ground because yeah. it shows us our limitations, you know? People are dying, you cannot go to work, um, people are, you know, losing houses as we were discussing in the very beginning. I don't know, I think that we would have to rediscuss and renegotiate a lot of uh, things, the, the way we do a lot of things in our society. Yeah hopefully for the more positive and not for the worst. But anyway, Phil, listen, thanks a lot for taking the time. Do not go anywhere. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. Oh, Phil, I lost you. Oh, there I'm you back. <laughs> thanks a lot for yeah. taking the time. I really appreciate it. I, this was a very inspiring conversation for me. I'm going to stop the recording. Don't go anywhere so that I can say Thank you in uh, one more time, okay? Okay, thank you. Thanks Bye -bye. a lot, dude. Thanks. <laughs>